Welcome to the final video of this three-part series covering the discovery of the Amazon according to the account of Friar Gaspar de Carvajal and other documents. Here is a quick summary of what has happened so far. In 1541, Gonzalo Pizarro heard rumors of cinnamon growing east of Quito, Peru, and led an expedition with his second-in-command, Francisco de Oriana. They began the expedition from Quito through the Andes Mountains, with 4,000 natives and around 300 Spaniards. A couple thousand natives and over a hundred Spaniards would die of sickness and starvation before they reached the Coca River just east of the Andes. Here, Pizarro commanded Oriana to go down the river in search of food with 57 men, including Gaspar de Carvajal. After traveling down the Coca River a ways, Oriana still had yet to find much food, other than roots in the jungle. Oriana was too late to realize that because of the current of the river, it would be nearly impossible for them to row upstream back to Pizarro's group. Oriana's men knew they would starve if they attempted to go back, so they threatened mutiny if they did not continue down the river in search of food. Oriana decided to make it official and wrote up an Articles of Agreement for all 57 men to sign as documentation, since Oriana knew that this would be seen as abandoning Pizarro, and he wanted to set the record straight that they had no choice and that all men agreed to this decision. They floated down the river for miles in a large raft they had made without finding any food. The men were in starvation so bad they could not walk and they were eating the leather of their shoes and hallucinating. At last, they finally met the friendly Operian natives who fed them and showed them great hospitality. The Operians told the Spaniards that they were children of the sun and that they warned them the Amazon warriors further down the river would be hostile towards them. Oriana's group stayed in this village for a couple of months while they built two brigantines, melting down their equipment to make nails. Eventually, they were able to leave this village with their two brigantines and plenty of food to sail down the river. Most of the natives they met after the Operians were hostile towards them, and thus the expedition was forced to battle thousands of native warriors and canoes. After sailing for miles and miles down the river and coming across many, many different tribes of hostile natives, eventually the expedition ran out of food again and started to raid native settlements on the riverbanks to feed themselves. The Spaniards came across multiple massive settlements with streets and buildings stretching for miles, massive amounts of food, zoo-like habitats for animals, and there were even larger settlements further inland that quote glimmered white at a distance from the river. The natives told them stories of cities inland which had tons of gold and silver, but Carvajal states multiple times that they were not interested since they were too concerned with just staying alive. Eventually, the expedition makes it to this peaceful village where we last left off which contains a mysterious castle-like decoration which poured wine from the bottom of it. And it's even more suspicious because how could they have known what a castle looks like if they had never had any castles in that area, according to our mainstream history? Yet, they have these interesting wine devices that are shaped like castles and have all this amazing design of jaguars and other amazing architecture. The image I'm showing to you now is by far the best depiction of this device and is most accurate to the description in Carvajal's account. These natives in this village where the device was in told the Spanish that they paid tribute to their quote mistresses, the Amazons further down the river. After staying in this mysterious village for a while, the expedition saw that the villagers would make sacrifices. The expedition disliked this and left this village. The expedition then came across another very large village with a similar hewn tree trunk and symbolic device. This village fought with the expedition, so they did not stay long. 
The expedition then passed by many more villages with warriors on shore ready to fight them, but, quote, as we had a certain amount of food on hand, and whenever there was some on hand, nowhere would he, Oriana, risk his life and those of the companions, end quote. On Wednesday, June 7th, 1542, the day before Corpus Christi, Oriana gave orders to make port at a small settlement which was seized without resistance. This settlement had lots of fish and only women, so the expedition decided to celebrate that holiday by staying the night in that village. But once the native men came back at night after working in the fields, they saw the Spanish had taken their homes and attacked in mass. The expedition fought the natives all night and Carvajal tended to the wounded companions. In the morning, Oriana decided to leave but before leaving, hung some of the natives that they had captured, so that any natives from here on would fear them and not attack. This did not work so well. The expedition once again made a narrow escape since after they got into their boat to leave, a huge number of Indians once again came out to attack them, but since they were already on their way down the river, they escaped unharmed. After sailing down the river for more than two days, they came across a massive wide river emptying into the Amazon River, which they named the Rio Grande. Continuing on, they saw more very large settlements on a slope next to the river. They approached the settlement to get a better look, and Carva Hall writes that, quote, They decided, so it seemed, not to show themselves, but to stay in hiding, thinking that we would leap on land, and for this reason they kept the roads that came down to the river cleared. The captain, Oriana, and a few companions understood the base action they had planned, and he ordered us to continue on, keeping well away from shore, and the Indians, seeing that we were passing by, well out from shore, rose up more than 5,000 strong, armed, and they began to shout at us, and challenge us, and strike their weapons against one another. And with this they made such a great noise, that it seemed as if the river were sinking from under us. We moved on, and having gone something like half a league, we came upon another larger village. But here we steered out of course, well out in the river. End quote. This land they were traveling through was very temperate and fertile, however the expedition did not get acquainted with this new tribe of people populating these various large settlements. Quote, Here this race of people came to an end, and we came upon another that gave us little trouble. We continued onward in our journey, and always through settled country, and one morning at 8 o'clock we saw on a high spot a fine looking settlement, which from appearances must have been the capital of some great overlord." End quote. The expedition, however, could not explore this capital but only look at it from the river because an island was in front of it and they had already passed the entrance. Quote, in this village there were seven gibbets, which we saw were at certain distances apart from one another throughout the village, and on the gibbets were nailed many dead men's heads, because of which circumstance we gave to this province the name Province of the Gibbets, which extended down the river seventy leagues. There came down to the river from this village roads made by hand, and on the one side and on the other were planted fruit trees, wherefore it seemed probable to us that it was a great overlord who ruled this land." End quote. The expedition proceeded onward, attacking another village where they burned the houses of the natives to drive them out so they could take their food. In this village, the expedition captured, quote, an Indian girl of much intelligence, and she said that nearby, back in the interior, there were many Christians like ourselves, and that they were under the rule of an overlord who had brought them down the river and she told us how there were two white women among them, as wives of the two of these Christians, and that others had Indian wives and children by them. These are the people who got lost out of Diego Ordaz's party, 
So it is thought from the indications which we were at hand regarding them. Four was off to the north of the river, end quote. You can pause here for context on this quote, or you can skip along to this part here if you want to hear the rest of the story and don't care about this. Here's a basic summary of Ordaz's expedition. Ordaz's expedition had one of his ships wreck very close to land. This ship had more than 300 men aboard, and some were said to have survived and lived with the natives on the mainland north of the Amazon River. However, some have said that the story is fiction and that all these men died. In my opinion, it is possible and likely that these 300 men who shipwrecked from Ordaz's expedition not too long before Oriana got there could have survived and lived among the natives around the Amazon River. The skeptic who wrote the quote above basically says that if they did survive, they would have been found in thousands of places. Well, it seems skeptics from the 16th century share similar intelligence to those of our time. Where does this guy get the confidence that if they were alive they would have been found all over the place? The region where they shipwrecked is not only next to a massive landmass, but also thoroughly unexplored for the time, and even a hundred years later. Even the editor H.C. Heaton placed a question mark next to this claim in his quote. Anyway, back to Oriana's expedition. After the Indian girl told the expedition about Christians being here, they proceeded down the river, refraining from attacking some villages they passed, since they still had plenty of food. At the end of this province they were in, they came across, quote, a very large settlement through which the Indian girl told us we had to go to get to where the Christians were. But as we were not concerned with this matter, we decided to press forward, for as to rescuing them from where they were, the time for that will come, end quote. Two native girls from this village rode up to the brigantine and were given many trinkets by the conquistadors who were trying to talk with them. But the two native girls just pointed toward the inland and left. The expedition was attacked the next day by natives and canoes from this village. The expedition continued on, and after five days they captured a village where the natives offered no resistance. The expedition found a great quantity of maize and oats from which the natives made bread and a very good wine resembling beer, and they had plenty of it. Quote, there was found in this village a dispensing place for this wine, a thing so unusual that our companions were not a little delighted. End quote. There was also many very high quality cotton goods found and a temple within the village where the natives hung many military adornments and above these were two mitres resembling those which bishops wear. They left this village after fighting with the natives. Quote, on Tuesday the 22nd of June we saw a great deal of inhabited country on the left shore because their houses were glimmering white but we could not see the inhabitants at that distance for we were going down the middle of the river we wanted to go over there but we could not because of the heavy current and the rougher waves, and there were more of them than at sea." End quote. The following Wednesday, the expedition captured a village on a very large piece of flat ground more than four leagues long. The village was built upon one long street with a square in the middle. They named this village Pueblo de la Calle, Village of the Street. On the following Thursday, June 22, 1542, quote, on rounding a bend which the river made, we should see on the shore ahead many villages and very large ones, which shone white. Here we came suddenly upon the excellent land and dominion of the Amazons, end quote. These villages in this region had been warned of the arrival of the Spaniards, and when the expedition tried to speak with some of them, they only laughed and mocked them. The natives said that down the river they were waiting for them and that they would take them captive and present them to the Amazons. Oriana was angered at the natives' arrogance and ordered the arquebusers to fire at the natives. They did this and the natives retreated back to their village, where the expedition decided to attack the natives. The natives fired an abundance of arrows at the Spanish so much so that they were too busy taking cover from arrows to be able to row their brigantine. In this exchange of arrows and arquebuser shots, quote, they had wounded five of us, whom I was one, 
for they hit me in one side with an arrow which went in as far as the hollow region and if it had not been for the thickness of my clothes that would have been the end of me." End quote. The natives did not retreat even though they were taking heavy losses, quote, for in spite of the damage that was being done to them they kept it up, some fighting and others dancing, and here we all came very close to perishing. End quote. The expedition finally succeeded in beaching the brigantines, and the natives met them in water up to their chests in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Carvajal detailed how the natives did not lose spirit, but instead gained spirit even though many of their comrades were dying. Quote, I want it to be known what the reason was why these Indians defended themselves in this manner. It must be explained that they are the subjects of and tributaries to the Amazons. In our coming, having been made known to them, they went to ask them for help. And there came as many as ten or twelve of them, for we ourselves saw these women who were there fighting in front of all the Indian men as women captains. And these latter fought so courageously that the Indian men did not dare to turn their backs. And anyone who did turn his back, they killed with clubs right there before us. And this is the reason why the Indians kept up their defense for so long. These women were very white and tall, and have hair very long and braided and wound about the head, and they are very robust and go about naked, but with their privy parts covered, with their bows and arrows in their hands, doing as much fighting as ten Indian men, and indeed there was one woman among these who shot an arrow a span deep into one of the brigantines, and others less deep, so that our brigantines looked like porcupines." End quote. The expedition killed seven or eight of the Amazon women, whereupon the native men lost heart and fully retreated. Other natives from separate villages were coming to give aid and so the expedition left with very great haste. The expedition had now traveled from the spot where they had left Gonzalo Pizarro 1,004 leagues, more or less, and they wondered how much more they had to go before reaching the Atlantic Ocean. In this last village with the Amazons, they captured an Indian trumpeter, about 30 years old, who, when he had been captured, started to tell the Captain Oriana many things about the country farther inland. After this skirmish with the Amazons, they were later ambushed by some natives, and, quote, in this village, they hit no one but me, for they planted an arrow shot right in one of my eyes, in such a way that the arrow went through to the other side, from which wound I have lost the eye, and even now I am not without suffering and not free from pain." End quote. The Spaniards retreated since they did not want to lose any men. This is one of the few times the Spanish were defeated in their objective, yet they were able to not take any casualties. They also saw that nearby this village, quote, at a distance of two leagues more or less, there could be seen some very large cities that glistened in white. And besides this, the land is as good, as fertile, and as normal in appearance as our Spain, end quote. The expedition sailed into the middle of the river to avoid, quote, inhabited districts, which were so large that they stirred up fear in us, end quote. They named this province the province of San Juan, since they entered it on that day. The province of San Juan was said by Carvajal to be 150 leagues long, and near the end of this province the expedition passed some inhabited islands, where, quote, there came out to meet us on the river over 200 pirogues, which are canoes, so large that each one carries 20 or 30 Indians and some 40, and of these there were many. They were quite colorfully decorated with various emblems, and they, those manning them, had with them trumpets and drums and pipes on which they play with their mouths, and rebecks, which among these people have three strings. 
and they came on with so much noise and shouting and in such good order that we were astonished." End quote. These natives surrounded the two brigantines and attacked, but were as usual repelled by the arquebusers and crossmen. Quote, and on land, a marvelous thing to see were the squadron formations that were in the villages, all the persons who composed them playing on instruments and dancing about, each man with a pair of palm leaves in his hands, manifesting very great joy upon seeing that we were passing beyond their villages." End quote. These islands the natives inhabited were said to be very fertile and beautiful in the eyes of the Spaniards, with the largest one being about five to six leagues long. The natives chased the two brigantines out of the province of San Juan. Oriana asked the captured native with them who the overlord of this area, the San Juan province, was, and the natives said it was Gonyuco or Quinec in another copy. Oriana then asked the captive native about the Amazons. I am just going to give you the full description straight from the text since I feel it would do you, the viewer, a disservice to paraphrase this incredible paragraph. Quote, the captain asked him what woman those women were and who had come to help them and fight against us. The Indians said that they were a certain women who resided in the interior of the country, a seven day journey from the shore, and that it was because this overlord, Konyuko, was subject to them that they had to come watch over the shore. The captain asked him if these women were married. The Indians said they were not. The captain asked him about how they lived. The Indian replied first that, as he had already said, they were off into the interior of the land, and that he had been there many times, and had seen their customs and mode of living, for as their vassal he was in the habit of going there to carry tribute whenever the lord the overlord sent him. The captain asked if these women were numerous. The Indian said they were, and that he knew by name seventy villages, and named them before those of us who were there present, and he added that he had been in several of them. The captain asked him if the houses in these villages were built of straw. The Indian said they were not, but out of stone and with regular doors, and that from one village to another went roads closed off on one side and on the other, and with guards stationed at intervals along them so that no one might enter without paying duties. The captain Oriana asked if these women bore children. The Indian answered that they did. The captain asked him how, not being married and there being no man residing among them, they became pregnant. He said that these Indian women consorted with Indian men at times, and when that desire came to them, they assembled a great horde of warriors and went off to make war on a very great overlord whose residence is not far from that land of these women. And by force they brought them to their own country and kept them with them for the time that suited their caprice. And after they found themselves pregnant, they sent them back to their country without doing them any harm. And afterwards, when the time came for them to have children, if they gave birth to any male children, they killed them and sent them back to their fathers, and if female children, they raised them with great solemnity and instructed them in the arts of war. He said furthermore that among all these women there was one ruling mistress who subjected and held under her hand and jurisdiction all the rest, which mistress went by the name of Konori. He said that there was in their possession a very great wealth of gold and silver, and that in the case of all the mistresses of rank and distinction, their eating utensils were nothing but gold or silver, while the other women belonging to the plebeian class used a service of wooden vessels, except what was brought in contact with fire which was of clay. He said that in the capital and principal city in which the ruling mistresses resided, there were five very large buildings, which were places of worship, and houses dedicated to the sun, which they called Karanain, and that, inside, from half a man's height above the ground, these buildings were lined with heavy wooden ceilings, covered with paint in various colors, and that in these buildings they had many gold and silver idols in the form of women, and many vessels of gold and of silver for the service of the sun. And these women were dressed in clothing of very fine wool, 
because in this land there are many sheep of the same sort as those of Peru. Their dress consisted of blankets girded about them, covering their bodies from the breast down, in some cases merely, thrown over their shoulders, and in others clasped together in front like a cloak. By means of a pair of cords, they wore their hair reaching down to, their, to the ground at their feet, and upon their heads were placed crowns of gold as wide as two fingers, and their individual colors. He said in addition that in this land, as we understood him, there were camels that carried them, the inhabitants on their backs, and he said that there were other animals, which we did not succeed in understanding about, which were as big as horses, and which had hair as long as the spread of the thumb and forefinger measured from tip to tip, and cloven hoofs, and that people kept them tied up, and that of these there were few. He said that there were in this land two saltwater lakes from which the woman obtained salt. He related that they had a rule to the effect that when the sun went down, no male Indian was to remain anywhere in all these cities, but that any such must depart and go to his own country. He said in addition that many Indian provinces bordering on them were held in subjection by them and made to pay tribute and to serve them, while other provinces there were with which they carried on war, in particular with the one which we have mentioned, and that they brought the men of this province there to have relations with them. These were said to be of very great stature, and white and numerous, and he claimed that all that he had told here he had seen many times as a man who went back and forth every day and all that this indian told us and more besides have been told to us six leagues from quito because concerning these women there were a great many reports and in order to see them many indian men came down the river 1400 leagues and likewise the indians farther up had told us that anyone who should take it into his head to go down to the country of these women was destined to go a boy and to return an old man. The country he, the captive Indian, said was cold and there was very little firewood there and it was very rich in all kinds of food. Also he told many other things and said that every day he kept fighting out more because he was an Indian of much intelligence and very quick to comprehend and so are all the rest in that land, as we have stated." End quote. This is by far the most detailed and vivid description of the Amazons I have ever read. The next day the expedition came across more settled land which was the most pleasant and brightest land that they had seen with many large settlements. This province was called Provincia de los Negros, which means province of the black men, because the people who lived in the settlement were stained black. These people attacked the expedition, but did no damage to them. A captive native with the Spaniards said that these people ate human flesh. This was the first cannibal people the expedition had come across so far on their journey, and the overlords of this area was said to be named Aripa, and it was he who held captive the Christians which they had heard about a while back. Despite learning this, the expedition decided to continue down the river without stopping since the area was too densely populated. After sailing further down the river and raiding some more villages, the expedition came to a larger village where the natives put up a great resistance. Before the Spaniards could even jump out of their brigantines to attack, a companion named Antonio de Carranza was killed. Quote, in this village, the Indians were familiar with some kind of poisonous plant for this became evident from the wound of the aforesaid man, because at the end of 24 hours, he surrendered his soul to God." End quote. After seeing the effects of this poison, the expedition decided that from here on, they would not set foot on land in a settled district unless it was of sheer necessity. The expedition sailed faster than ever down the river, and added some railings and fortifications to their brigantines to better protect from poisonous arrows. While building these fortifications, local natives sailed by them on their canoes and just watched the expedition. Carvajal writes about a strange bird there, which apparently cried, Hui, Hui. 
In the version of Carvajal's relation inserted in Ovidio's Historia, it is explained that this word means hut, but it could also mean flee. The expedition said that they met this bird at the first village where they built the brigantines, and it alerted them that they were about to enter an inhabited area, and since they found that this bird would warn them whenever they would enter an inhabited area, they would always gear up for battle whenever they heard its cry. Here this bird left them, and never more did they hear it. The expedition moved on further, evading massive groups of natives until they noticed that the tide in the river was changing, and they finally realized they were close to the ocean. The group was then attacked by many squadrons of natives on canoes and pirogues, where another companion named Garcia de Soria was killed with another poison arrow, which did not even penetrate half a finger into him before killing him. They said that the river was cluttered with pirogues, and the expedition had to fight them off for hours. Two remarkable shots helped the group escape natives. One was fired by the Lieutenant Maldonado, who killed two natives with one shot, which caused many other natives to jump into the water to avoid being shot. The other remarkable shot was made by Perucho, who caused the rest of the natives to retreat after leaving behind their comrades in the water, all of which died according to Carvajal. After this, the brigantine sailed further down the river, passing by some large settlements further inland and a few fortresses which they did not bother with. The group passed into land that was at sea level with very little population, and this is where they finally reached the sea, the Atlantic Ocean. Carvajal estimates that they had traveled from the beginning of Pizarro's camp all the way down the river to sea 1,800 leagues. While making their way out of the mouth of the Amazon, they stopped for 18 days to make nails and to repair the brigantines to make them better equipped for navigating the ocean. They made sails out of blankets they had slept in, and made rigging out of vines, all the while in hunger, eating only snails and small crabs they had found on the coast. They departed from this place August 8, 1542, and were constantly in danger of shipwrecking in this estuary because of the strong tides and waves. The expedition finally passed out of the estuary and into the open sea August 26, 1542, where they traveled up the coast. The two brigantines on the day of the beheading of St. John got separated from each other, and Carvajal and the others assumed the rest were lost at sea and they would never see them again. Eventually, the brigantine Carvajal was in and made it to the island of Cubaga in the city of Nueva Cadiz, where they found their companions they had lost at sea and the other brigantine, who arrived there two days before them on September 9th, 1542, and Carvajal's group arriving September 11th. Carvajal assumed the distance from the mouth of the river to Cubaga was 450 leagues by latitude. We have finally come to the end of the expedition. Here I will give you Carvajal's conclusion on this epic adventure. Quote, I, brother Gaspar de Carvajal, the least of the friars of the order of our brother and friar, Father Saint Dominic, have chosen to take upon myself this little task and recount the progress and outcome of our journey and navigation, not only in order to tell about it and make known the truth in the whole matter, but also in order to remove the temptation from many persons who may wish to relate this peregrination of ours or publish just the opposite of what we have experienced and seen and what I have written and related is the truth throughout, and because profuseness engenders distaste, so I have related sketchily and summarily all that has happened to Captain Francisco de Oriana, and to the Hidalgos of his company, and to us companions of his, who went off with him after separating from the expeditionary corps of Gonzalo Pizarro, brother of Don Francisco Pizarro, the Marquis and Governor of Peru. God be praised. Amen. End quote. Thus we come to the end of this great story. Later on, Captain Francisco de Oriana would be basically court-martialed by the Spanish government because they assumed he had abandoned Gonzalo Pizarro and his men. 
Thankfully, with the documents Oriana had and the testimony of his men, he was able to prove in court that he was forced to leave Pizarro in order to survive. Oriana would later return on a second expedition to the Amazon, but would end up dying there of disease. Carvajal would return to South America and continue being a missionary to the natives and sending letters to the King of Spain for the sake of the natives' well-being. I first heard about this story from Graham Hancock, and I decided to investigate it for myself and read this amazing account. The hubris of academics who have dismissed the credibility of this account nauseates me, and it makes me realize that most of these historians really don't have a clue what they're talking about. With all the new LiDAR evidence, which I cover in the first video of this series, as well as the Terra Preta evidence, it is clear that this account is more close to reality than many have previously thought. Of course, I bet some of the story is exaggerated, such as the instances where Carvajal states that 10 men held off 2,000 natives or so by themselves. Regardless of small exaggerations like this, I take this account to be very accurate. Stories like this really should humble us in our postmodernist age, where we think that we have all of our history figured out, when in reality, we do not. I assume there are many stories like this that have been swept aside by academics and historians, and I plan on investigating more of our history in the future. Thank you for watching. If you like this, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. I am so sorry this has taken so long to make, and I promise I'll be posting videos more frequently. I have many videos in the bank already that I plan on posting, and not all of them are history videos. A lot of them are like survival hit videos, but I assume you guys will enjoy them anyway. And anyway, Thank you for watching this. God bless you, and I hope you have a great day.